Uh, have you ever been in search of the perfect gift? Uh, sometimes it feels like it takes you years to, and when it doesn't, you wait till the last minute, gift card, I guess, will always, always work, huh? You know, the uh, wise men, I don't know if there's a story in the Bible that is more uh, shrouded with mystery for me than the story of the Magi. Especially, you know, there's lots of conjecture about the gifts, what they meant. And, uh, what they, you know, the other day, uh, several members of my family watched a family Christmas classic for our family. Don't know if you've ever heard of this movie, The Greatest Christmas Pageant Ever. It's, it's a, a low-budget movie. It, uh, you don't watch it for its acting or cinematography, but it, it, the, the message is really a fun movie. It's about this group of kids uh, called the Herdmans. It's this family, the Herdmans. There are six kids in the Herdman family. They, they hang together like a gang. They're on the, born on the other side of the tracks. They live on the other side of the tracks. There's no dad at home. Mom's working multiple jobs. A deep poverty. The kids are always messy and dirty and getting in trouble with the law and everything else. Well, one day... They show up at church because they heard there's treats at church, you know. So they all show up at church and they steal the money out of the offering plates and everything else. But then they hear the the pastor make an announcement about how the Christmas pageant is coming and the kids can all participate. And this intrigues the Herdmans. And so they crash the, the, the tryouts for the Christmas pageant. And through intimidation and threats, they secure all the main parts in the, in the Christmas pageant. The issue is, though, they don't know what a Christmas pageant is. They don't know the Christmas story. They've never heard this before. And so the director is, is aghast, and so she reads them this story. And as they're listening to the Christmas story for the first time, they're like, you know, are you serious? She's going to have a baby and she's in a barn for crying out loud. And, and why is Herod trying to kill him? And who's Herod? You know, we got to get rid of Herod. How dare him try to kill the baby? And, and the, the wise men are bringing gifts. They're like, they're like the welfare. We know all about him. You know, so they got all this, this going on. Well, the, comes the night of the pageant. And they're getting ready to go on. And, and Leroy Herdman is, is one of the wise men. Okay, that's that's, his, that's his, his, his position. But he can't imagine giving a gift of frankincense, giving him oil, giving the baby oil. You know, he's just saying, this is such a stupid gift. And so just before the pageant, he leaves, goes home. And he rumbles his way through the the welfare basket. And he finds the biggest, best gift that they they had in the basket, a big old ham. You know, and so he comes in the pageant just before he's supposed to go. And he runs up front and he starts leading the pageant, holding this big Christmas ham. You know, and he lays it at the feet of Jesus. uh, And the pageant goes on. After the pageant is over, the director says, you know what, Leroy, it was a wild gift. But you can go ahead and take your gift back now. And he says, it's a gift to Jesus You don't take that back. And he he leaves. And it's all over. But you know what happened in all the Herdman's, but Leroy Herdman's heart is it's been changed. When he saw Christmas through the eyes of the wise men, his heart was changed. This morning, this is what, what we want to do. We want to look at a familiar story often associated with with Christmas and uh, see if we can pull a Leroy Herdman. You know, if we can see Christmas through the eyes of a wise man and what that might do for us. You know, this is a fascinating story. This is one of the reasons why this is such a fascinating story for, for me because it's in the book of Matthew and if you understand something about Matthew, you, you know he's writing to Jewish people to try to convince them that Jesus really is the king of the Jews. Uh, The gospel writers were not just historians. They were not just trying to gather all the things and put everything in there. John lets us know that if everything Jesus did was was written down, all the libraries in the world couldn't hold the books. And so the, the gospel writers weren't making anything up, but they were selective in what they put in. And so you have to ask yourself, why did Matthew include this story? Because you, you've got, you got Gentile folk not in the covenant. It's not fulfilling any Old Testament prophecy. They're, they're, they're pagans epitomized. Why would Matthew include that in this? In this where, where they are the first ones to worship Jesus. I mean, that would make his audience very skeptical of the whole story. That would bring about suspicion. You need to know that there's no reason in the world Matthew would include this story in. He would not have made this up. He wouldn't, it adds nothing. The only reason why he would have put this in here is if it really happened. 
I think sometimes we think of the star and the, the wise men. It's just a nice myth, like Frosty or Santa Claus. It's just a, but it's not. When we realize, no, just the fact that it's there is an apologetic for its truthfulness. Now, still lots of questions, and we're going to look, look at some of those. But I want to invite you to, to grab your Bible. If you brought it this morning, hope you did. Matthew chapter 2, as we look at the story of the wise men. Right at the beginning, chapter 2, verse 1. Matthew, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. All right, let's let's just look at some of the main characters for a second. That's going to help us understand this passage. Uh, Herod. Herod the Great. Well, we know Herod was an actual historical figure. Lots of, of, of secular history written at this time talks of Herod the Great. Herod was born in about 70 BC. He was born in Rome. He was born in a very upper crust, royal type family. His father uh, actually bailed Julius Caesar out of trouble at one point. Herod knew Mark Antony. He knew Octavian, who would be the, the emperor. Uh, he, he, he ran with the big dogs. And at one point, Rome gave Herod jurisdiction over Palestine. And so Herod goes to Palestine, and and he tries to take on uh, the Prithians. But the Prithians chase him out of town. It's 40 B.C. Well, he goes back to Rome, and he tells them this is what happened. Well, Rome says, you know, we'll show those Prithians, and they, they, they give Herod a title. This is his title, Herod the Great, King of the Jews. Rome said he was. It's official. Herod is the king of the Jews. And so Herod goes back to Palestine with his reinforcements. They drive, 37 BC, they drive the Prithians out, and Herod sets himself up in, in Palestine as the king of the Jews. And he took this seriously. He really thought he was king of the Jews. Rome said so, and so he was. Herod was an incredible military mastermind. I mean, he was like trained in the West Point of, of the day. Not only could he drive out the Perithians and win uh, Palestine for the Roman emperor, but he could keep peace in that part of the land, which was no easy feat. Just today, it's, it's a hotbed. It was back then as well. Herod could keep peace, generally speaking, for quite some time. Herod was a uh, major architect. He's a big thinking guy. You know, he did not remodel rooms in his house. You know, he remodeled cities. You know, he, he wanted everything to look a certain way. And so he remodeled Damascus and Sidon and Tyre and, and uh, built up Caesarea. Uh, Herod, when he got there, he saw the Jewish temple. And he didn't care much for the Jewish temple, but the Jews, his people, because he was their king, they liked it. And so he said, well, if you're going to like this thing, we're going to make it something special. And so, starting in 19 BC, all the way up into Jesus' life, this thing was being remodeled. When he was done with it, it would have more square footage, the area, than our mall. It would be covered with um, marble and gold. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It sat up on the hill so everyone could just see the sun gleaming off. It was just, the temple was magnificent. It's what Herod was into. Herod was also a benevolent leader to an extent, He really took seriously his being the king of the Jews. Rome Rome said he was. And so when uh, different problems came on his people, he would give uh, tax relief at different times. The records say in 25 BC, a famine hit Israel. And if you believe these records from Herod or not, it says that he melted down some of his own gold to buy food for his people, Israel, because he was the king of the Jews. Herod also was a bloodthirsty tyrant. He had, uh, his paranoia really grew as he got older in life, and some of it may have been justified, but he put to death seven out of 10 of his wives, including his most beloved wife, Miriam, because he thought she might have treason in her heart. He put to death three of his sons 
because he thought they might have been anticipating a coup of some sort for his, his key generals. I mean, you did not want to be, uh, um, get the, the promotion to one of his key generals because sooner or later you would be killed as well because he was afraid that you were thinking about taking over. And so he was constantly purging. Uh, Herod set out a command that when he was going to die, they would round up some of the most influential men in Israel and kill them at the moment he died just to make sure that everybody grieved when he died. He was just a a bloodthirsty tyrant person. This is Herod. Magi. Who are the Magi? Uh, So this is great because much of what we know about the Magi, Magi is not true. You know, we three kings, right? Well, there probably weren't three. We think that perhaps there were three because of three gifts. But, you know, tradition says that there were many gifts of gold. There could have been many of the wise men. Who knows? Uh, we, we say that they were kings. They probably were not kings. We say that they were from the Orient. Well, they weren't from the Far East anyway. Uh, they did not come to the manger. I know we've got that on our little, uh, in our nativity scene. We got them at the, they didn't come to the manger. We're going to find that they came to the house And the word that is used for the baby is not the word for infant, it's for little child, so maybe toddler, Jesus. So they came multiple weeks, up to two years after Jesus was born. Much of what we know about them is just we've learned from tradition and from uh, a mall in the night, visitors or whatever else. Um, Some things we do know about them, though, is they were uh, most probably senators, of Persia, they were Prithians. And they, they, these guys would have been uh, to Persia what the Levites were to Israel. They were a leading uh, government caste in, in Persia, uh, high-ranking folk. Uh, these guys were, were magi. And you know what word we get from magi? Magician. These were not folk you would want babysitting your kids. These guys were astrologers. Think occult. These guys are the guys that wrote horoscopes. These were were, were people that were into black magic. These were wizards. Now, they were also philosophers. What they were trying to do was figure out why is life worth living? What is the the, the purpose of it? No doubt into Zoroastrianism at the the time. They were very... uh, uh, philosophical, studying the holy books of Egypt and of Babylon and of Israel and and searching out the stars and trying to figure out how to make sense of life. These are the magi. Uh, Again, this is what makes you wonder about Matthew. If you want Jewish people to believe your story, don't have these be the guys that are worshiping Jesus on the front end. And then you talk about the star. I'll tell you, last year, I, I read a book, probably about 300 pages on the, trying to figure out the identity of the star. Over the years, lots of journal articles and everything else. No one knows for sure. And let me just say this. When scripture's clear, we gotta be dogmatic and clear. When scripture is not as clear, we gotta take the same stance. What was the star? Who knows? Uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is the uh, uh, royal planet, and they say that, it, that there's a conjunction between the two every 805 years, and cer- certainly in, in 6 BC, uh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn would have had a conjunction and moved through Pisces, which is the, remember these guys are astrologers, right, the, the constellation associated with the Jews. Some have said, no, it was 2 to 3 BC, we had Jupiter, had, had, a, constel- had a conjunction with, with Venus and Mercury, and that's what it was. Uh, Kepler said, no, 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 this was, this was Halley's Comet that they saw, and others have said, no, it was a supernova, and uh, uh, there's, of course, the, the thought that, no, this was nothing less than the Shekinah glory that led them. We don't, we don't, reality is we don't know. We do know that the heavens declared the glory of God that Satan doesn't control the stars, that according to Isaiah 40, God has placed them in and called them by name. He directs them. Romans 1 lets us know that nature can speak of the attributes of of God. So who knows what it it exactly was. But we know this. Whatever the, the star was, it was so significant to these guys. They saw this, and it was unlike anything they had ever seen before, so much so that they were willing to leave 
Persia and fi find this guy. This is, what the star is is not the question for me, but it's how did these magi figure out that this star, whatever it was, equaled the birth of a Jewish king? And then why would they leave Persia to worship a Jewish king? They should worship the Persian king. They've got their king. What was it that made them feel like they needed to go? This would have almost been treason in their own country. What, was, what were they thinking? What's going on? Whatever this thing was they saw, it was so incredibly different than anything they had observed before. So, so radical that they, they were sure. They went. They went. Now, now you, you got the, this picture. You're putting all this in your mind. Uh, 40 BC, right? The Perithians chase Herod out. 37 BC, Herod comes back and chases the Prithians out. About 30 years later, right here, Prithian senators come rolling into town. And they've, however many there are, you can bet there's a major entourage. There are bodyguards, there's, there's, there's uh, uh, their family, there, there's all kinds of, 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 of gifts, and there's all kinds of, of, of food and tents. There's, so there's this massive caravan of Prithian senators, people who were not really doing well with Herod, they come rolling into Jerusalem, the capital. And, and, and the, the, these folks start asking, and the, the Magi had a, made a mistake here. They, they assumed that the uh, baby coming, the new king, that all the people in Jerusalem would be pumped about this, and they would be excited, and they would all know it. They knew it, and they were pagans from you know, hundreds of miles away. Certainly, all the Jewish people would know it. So they roll into town saying, where is he? And they're going, people are going, who? Well, you know, the, the, the new baby. What are you talking about? You know, the king. The king is, is Herod. He's over there in the palace. No, 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 no. The, the king who was born, king of the Jews. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, Herod's advisors hear what's going on. I mean, again, these guys would have stuck out like a four-color picture in, in a black and white magazine. And so they, they're from Herod. You're not going to believe who's in town. Remember these guys you chased out? Well, they're, they're back. No, they don't have any weapons or anything. They look like they're, but they're asking about this new king of the Jews. And here it's going, wait, 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 wait. I'm king of the Jews. What are you talking about? So he brings them in. And, and they, they, have a, they have a discussion. This is after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Notice that they didn't ask. Uh, you know, we think this might be true. You know, back in, in Persia, there was this rumor out, and I think Daniel may have started this, you know, hundreds of years ago, and of course, there's still lots of Jewish people there always talking about a Messiah, and, and we're, we're, not, we're not sure. You know, your, your holy book, Numbers 24, 17, talks about uh, in a messianic prophecy about how a star is arising out of Jacob, and so we put this all together, and, and we think this, what do you think, is this true? They don't, they don't ask that. They, they don't say, you know, is this really his title? You know, king of the Jews. They don't say, where is the one who will become king of the Jews? They say, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? So they're talking to Herod. And they're saying, Herod, uh, let's, we're, we're adults here, right, Herod? We know that you're not really Jewish. And, and you know that you're not really Jewish. And this is Jewish land. And, and we, we know that Rome has said you were the king of the Jews, but... but God has chosen his king. It's not you, Herod. And he's been born, so we're looking for him. Where is he? The, 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 the Magi, you know, it's normal. Remember, they go see Jesus. They, they give him gifts. Well, it's normal when you go see a, a king that you bring gifts. They're kind of like a peace offering. We're not here trying to cause trouble. They're, 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 they're showing your, your submission to, your, your recognition of their authority. You notice they don't give Herod any gifts. Now, we got gifts here, but they're, they're not for you because you're not the real king, Herod. They're for this baby. Now, knowing what you know about Herod, can you imagine how this might have gone over with him? Oh, this didn't go over very well at all, Right? And he, he kind of kind of flips out. But but in verse three, it says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. <laughs> all Jerusalem knows his temper, this is not going to end well. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. 
In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. This, here we see three different responses to, to Christmas. And the first response we see is from the, the scribes and the teachers of the law. Uh, Herod wants to know where this new king is, so he calls the Jewish leaders in. He says, well, where? They don't hesitate, right? Immediately, right off the top of their head. You know, Ada, of course, he's in Bethlehem. I mean, the prophet said this. We've done word studies on this. You know, we've done Bible studies on this. I'm writing an article right now about this very thing. He's gonna be born in Bethlehem. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that if all these guys are looking for the Messiah and they know he's gonna be born in Bethlehem, that when these, these magi show up and they said, he's born, where's he at? You would think that these guys would get excited. I say, really, really, really? You'd think they would ask to go with them. Can we go with you to see? Can we get your ride? We, we just want to want to see them. But nothing. The, the amazing thing here isn't what they say, it was what they don't say. They they don't mention, wow, we really want to go as well. No. These magi who had the least amount of scripture the least amount of truth, were in greatest pursuit of it. Isn't that amazing? See the, see the irony here? Uh, you notice, right, that the Magi, though they could see some things about God and the stars, that couldn't get them to Jesus. They had to get Scripture to get there. They had to, they had to figure out what, what Scripture said to get there. And these guys who, who know the Bible very well are not interested in, in going I think uh, you, you read that and you, you get a conviction, maybe a rebuke. It says, hey, Harris, why are you studying the Bible? Why did the wise men want to know what the Bible said? There's only one reason. They wanted to know what the Bible said so they could get to Jesus and worship him. And I would propose that any other reason is, is damning. It's wrong. Studying the Bible just for the sake of uh, hobby. So, you know, these guys, it's interesting, these scribes and Pharisees, 30 years from right here, Jesus is a man walking around, and he would talk to these, some of these, maybe some of these very people, certainly some of their children. I don't have this on the screen, but John 5, 39 and 40. Boy, listen, just listen to this. Jesus is talking to them, right? And he says, you search the scriptures diligently, because in them you think that you have eternal life. These are the scriptures that speak of me, yet you refuse to come to me. Write that down. Let me, let me say that again. It just soak on the words for this. Jesus talking to the scribes, Pharisees, these, some of these same people, maybe definitely some of their kids, and he says, you search the scriptures diligently. It's good to search the scriptures diligently, right? These guys did. Jesus said, you do that. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the scriptures that speak of me, yet you refuse to come to me. Now, you get the distinction. As Christians, sometimes we think that Christendom is all about knowing the Bible. But we've got to keep in mind that knowing the Bible and knowing Jesus, two different things. Right? Two, two different things. And please hear me right. I'm not dissing knowing the Bible. I have regular times alone with the Lord every day, just about every day. I've got a, my own plan for Bible memory. I've been reading books. I've been doing this consistently. I'm all for Bible study. Please don't, don't hear me wrong. But you've got to know uh, that some of us may know the prophecies, but they're not leading us to Christ. Because we're really not, that's not what we want. We're going to just hobby studiers. Some people are into stamps. Some people are into Civil War history. We're, we're into the Bible stuff. That's what, we, that's what we do. In this Christmas season, we've got to make sure that we're just not in that boat. For those of us who grew up in the church, that's a, it's an occupational hazard. and we, that, Something we might have to fight. We're, we're not going to be there. We want to study Scripture so that we can worship Jesus more purely. That's the only reason. That's, that's the only reason. Well, Herod has a response as well. It says, then Herod called the Magi secretly 
and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Well, you know the story, right? The Magi go and they say, okay, that's cool. They go and then an angel tells them, comes to them in a dream and says, don't go back and tell Herod because he's really not interested in worshiping Jesus. So they sneak out the back door. Verse 16, it says, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Herod's got an a attitude of hostility towards Jesus. And this is, this is much more common than you think because Herod, is, he understands some stuff. He understands who a king is. A king is one who makes the rules. A king is one who everyone else lives to please. A, ki a king is one who's the final authority. He likes being king. He's not interested in sharing that. Now his kingdom is filled with gold and harems and, and pageantry and hate and deception and anxiety as well, but it's dysfunctional as it is. He likes it. It's his kingdom and he's not interested in, in sharing or even trading it. No, another king just isn't going to work. And so he goes, at Christmas time, when we just talk about the little baby in the manger, you know, a lot of people are, oh, that's nice. You know, it's got a good feeling, you know, just a good feeling. Little baby in the manger, just miraculous birth, that's nice. But when you realize, oh, no, 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 he's come as king. People are like, ah, well, you know what, different issue. Because I'm, I'm not so sure I'm interested in relinquishing any of my kingdom to him. I know what I think about my money or my sexuality or my, my pleasures or my entertainment. I, I, like to, I like other people living for me and I want to live for me and what I want. And No, another king isn't going to work. There's a lot of Herod out there. I think wonder sometimes how much Herod is in my own system. Well, yeah, you, you say like Herod, I want to worship Jesus. Yeah, but sometimes when push comes to shove, different things, yeah, maybe not here. Maybe not there. You know, that's, that's Herod. That's Herod. You know, Herod's shoes, his sandals, his, uh, sitting on his throne this morning at all. Herod. There's another response, though. Verse 9, it says, And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. You know, I think the NIV misses it here. New American Standard, I think, is closer to the original. It says, When they saw the star... They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now, if it would have just said they rejoiced, we would have got the idea, right? Oh, yeah, they were happy. They rejoiced. No, no, no. They rejoiced exceedingly. What's that look like? I don't know, but rejoiced on steroids, I guess. Okay. And if they would have just said that, we'd go, wow, they were really happy. No, no, it doesn't stop there. They, if they would have just said then, they rejoiced exceedingly with joy. Well, well, okay, that takes it another step. But he says that's not enough. He goes further. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I mean, that's, I can't even hyperbolize that. There's just so many superlatives added to this thing. What's this look like? They see the star when they get done with Herod. Oh, look, the star. Is that exceedingly great joy? No, no, I, I don't know. They're jumping up and down and they're dancing. and I, I don't know what they're doing, but they are, they are very excited, right? So they get to uh, Mary in, in the, main, uh, the house on coming to the house, not the manger. They saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They bowed down and worshipped him, this peasant baby. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. I think what Matthew's doing, why he's put this text here, it's theological reasons. One, he's going to let the people know, his readers, that from the very beginning, there were people who didn't like Jesus. Jesus. Tried to kill him from the beginning. He didn't do anything. He hadn't said a word yet trying to murder him. That, that from the beginning, his own people were not interested in him. And Matthew's, I think this is the biggest thing that Matthew's saying. And not only that, 
Jesus is the king of the Jews, but he's the king of the Jews for all people. He's the king of all. And even if you're a pagan, you're outside the covenant. If you will seek him and you'll come before him and you, you will uh, bow down, giving over everything that's important to you to him. You know what? He's your king. I think Matthew's letting the folk know right on the front end. He's king of the Jews, but it's bigger than that. It's a lot bigger than that. It, we could do a whole study, too, on the way these guys worshipped, couldn't we? They, it says they worshipped, but they didn't sing. Sometimes we equate the two. with and, and singing can certainly be part of worship when we sing from our heart, but uh, uh, it doesn't define worship. They could worship without it. They had joy at one point, but they don't have any at the house. It doesn't say. And Sometimes we, we equate good feelings and lots of emotion with worship. It could be. But not necessarily. But look, look what they did. This is not a message on giving, by the way. But look what they did. It's fascinating. They gave to him uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. And there's lots of conjecture. Again, the gifts, the gold was the, was the kingly thing. And the frankincense, it was an incense that was used in the anointing of the priest. And so he was a priest. And then the myrrh was an embalming thing that they used in Egypt. And so it was, it was uh, showing his death. I don't know, maybe. But I do know this. These were gifts that only a king could get. These were incredibly priceless, expensive, exquisite gifts. And so when these guys are giving, they really are giving the absolute best they have. Now, here's, here's, here's the deal. Lots of questions about the Magi. Lots of questions about this whole thing, this whole group. They kind of blow into town. Unexpectedly, they blow out. We know very little about them. But I think we know as much about them as the Holy Spirit, as Matthew, wants us to know. Because the issue is not about, right, the identity of the Magi. It's not about uh, what did their gifts, what were their gifts about. It's not about how far did they travel, if we look at the story through those eyes, we're just missing it. It's about not the gifts they gave, but the gift they received. 1964. Kitty Genovese, she's a New York City 28-year-old gal. She comes home at night. This was a very popular story way back when. But she comes home at night. She parks her car in her apartment. You know, apartment building parking lot. She's walking to her apartment building and she's assaulted. And she starts screaming, you know, help me, help me. He's stabbing me, help me. According to the New York Times, 38 different people, their lights went on in their apartment. They heard the screams, but no one comes down. And so the assailant, when, when he hears the screams, he takes off. But when he realizes that no one's coming down, five minutes later, he had wounded her. He came back and killed her, finished, killed her. And then when the New York Times interviewed these people saying, this woman is screaming, what's going on? How come you didn't come down? And, and just about everybody, the same excuse, uh, I was afraid. You see, if I come down, I'm vulnerable. It's, I could get hurt. I, I, I didn't, who am I to fight off a guy with a knife? It's, it's, I, I, I was afraid for myself. The Christmas story is all about God hearing the screams of his people. God hearing the, the cries of pagan folk trying to find purpose and meaningful in life, in uh, nature, things he created, but still a distance from him. God heard the, the cries of his people who were hurting, and God came down. And he didn't come down with the thought that, you know, well, if I go down, it could cost me. It could hurt me. It might cost, cost something. He came down knowing I'm going to go help. But in my helping, I'm going to be killed. He came knowing that. And so the whole story is not, again, the gifts that the wise men gave, but the gift that they received when they were bowing down before Jesus. And so this, this Christmas, all the hullabaloo going on. Just a reminder that Christmas is about not all the parties, and the, those, those can be good things, uh, but it's about God giving the gift to us. It's not about 
the manger. Jesus was keeping in mind that if you have the manger without the cross, we're still, none of us are on our way to heaven. None of us have our sins forgiven. None of us are, 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 are redeemed. He's born that he might die. So this holiday season, let me ask you, if you've ever come to a place where you receive that gift, where, where, where you've bowed down before him and you've given him uh, the most important things to you, you, uh, in giving, that's when we receive him. Would you pray with me?